Urging the government to bolster its coronavirus vaccination awareness campaign because of fears the take-up of the vaccine is just too low. The Australian Medical Association says Australians will be sitting ducks for a wave of infections from overseas if more people don't get vaccinated soon. Political reporter Matthew Doran joins us now from Parliament House in Canberra. Matt G'day, so take us through these concerns from the AMA. Well, effectively, Joe, the worry is that the current campaign is too boring. It might well uh, explain the mechanics of the vaccine rollout. So when you're eligible to go and line up and get your vaccine, where you can go and get it. But apart from that, it's not really explaining to people the benefits of vaccination. Now, we know that the vaccine rollout has been hampered over its initial stages. It's been criticised as being too slow. There have been supply issues. The states and territories have all handled this in a slightly different different way when it comes to mass vaccination centres. The GPs have been concerned that they haven't been getting enough supply. And when you take into account that public debate and the figures that we are getting from the government, there is this concern that uh, the vaccine take up is simply too low. If you look at an issue like international borders, we know that the government says it won't reopen international borders until it is safe to do so. But that is in and, in and of itself is being seen as uh, something that is contributing to this slow take up because people don't see the urgency to go out there and roll their sleeves up. And the same, or in a similar uh, vein, the discussion about the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is now the vaccine of choice for Australians over the age of 50. Uh, there is a debate about whether people are too hesitant to get that vaccine because of the incredibly small number of rare blood clotting cases that have been linked to people who have got that vaccine, uh, whether or not people are holding off to get one of the other vaccines as they come into to the Australian supply chain, specifically the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines, which some are arguing or are perceiving at the very least uh, to be a more superior type of vaccine. They're not expected to arrive in the country until later this year. The overwhelming health advice is that all the vaccines that have been approved for use in Australia are safe to uh, be used across the population, that uh, the benefits of vaccination are vastly outweigh the uh, risks of, uh, of any medical side effects and, of course, the uh, risk of getting coronavirus itself. But those concerns don't seem to be tallying up, at least within the minds of uh, medical authorities or medical uh, professionals. They don't seem to be tallying up with the way in which the government is selling this campaign. And so what are some of the suggestions to improve the marketing campaign? Well, some of the uh, reflections have been on the success of campaigns overseas, taking uh, into account, for example, the campaigns that we've seen in Singapore and New Zealand. They have been uh, clearly developed by uh, creative advertising agencies. They use music, they use catchy jingles, they use a bit of humour to try to get their message across. And while it's not necessarily just those jingles and writing uh, that is uh, capturing the attention of organisations like like the AMA. They're also saying that the messages contained in those uh, campaigns are properly explaining to the community the merits of vaccination. For instance, if you go and get vaccinated now, you might be able to see that relative who's living overseas who you haven't seen for more than a year much more quickly because the borders could indeed uh, reopen. So that's the sort of thinking that's being uh, floated out there. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has been on Melbourne radio this morning. He's defended the advertising campaign, uh, which is so far costing the Commonwealth around $40 million. He says it will be evolving over time, but that still isn't good enough for uh, some in the public health sector, including Bill Botel, who's got a bit of experience working in this public messaging sort of space uh, due to his work back in the uh, 80s and 90s on the HIV AIDS campaign. He was speaking to News Breakfast a little earlier. I was involved in the Grim Reaper campaign and we had a very hard sell in those years. We should learn from what happened then. We had to convince people to adopt very serious behaviour change about sexual behaviours, about injecting drug use and so on uh, against a virus. We didn't have a vaccine then. I wish we had, but we didn't. We had to promote behavioural change. And it was a very tough sell. But the campaign was highly uh, memorable. And Matthew, this discussion is happening here as the situation becomes just incredibly desperate in India with more than 4,500 deaths in one day there yesterday and news of another Australian death there. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, 51-year-old Australian man Sunil Khanna died in India in late April. He travelled to India uh, some time ago to be with his elderly parents who were in their 80s and in recent uh, weeks uh, all three of them had contracted coronavirus. Uh, unfortunately, the day after Mr Khanna died, his mother also died, but his 84-year-old father uh, has recovered from the virus and now his family and friends here in Australia are urging the government to show some compassion, even though he isn't a citizen or permanent resident of Australia, urging them to show some compassion and allow him to come to Australia uh, to uh, be supported here. Uh, the federal opposition has said that this is a, an incredibly uh, devastating set of circumstances, not just for uh, the Canna family, but for all of those who have loved ones in Australia. They've again taken a swipe at the Commonwealth for failing to invest in uh, something that they say is highly necessary and uh, needed in these circumstances, and that is is more uh, independent and uh, specialised, rather, uh, quarantine facilities across the country beyond the Howard Springs facility in the Northern Territory. The Deputy Labor leader, Richard Miles, was on News Breakfast earlier today and he said that the uh, Commonwealth and the Federal Government is trying to absolve itself of responsibility for quarantine and it's leading uh, to many families feeling like they've been forgotten. And the appalling circumstances of lots of Australians seeking to come back from India who you know, are struggling to come back because we don't have the facilities in place to enable that. And at the end of the day, that's the Commonwealth's responsibility. That's the Deputy Labor Leader Richard Miles speaking earlier. This news of, uh, of uh, Sunil Khanna uh, dying comes just a couple of days after Sydney businessman uh, Govind Kant uh, was also revealed to have died in Delhi in the last couple of days. We got an update on to the number of Australians who are currently in India hoping to come home. That is over 11,000 so far and those repatriation flights, while they will make a dent in the list, it won't be a very big one and uh, particularly when uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is considering more than 900 of those people to be vulnerable at this stage. Joe. OK, Matthew Doran there in Canberra. And we'll be chatting to a health expert, a public health expert, in the next 20 minutes or so about these calls for the federal government to improve its campaign at the moment, encouraging people to go and get vaccinated. And we'll take a look at some of those ads from overseas then. The Queensland government is hoping a new cash incentive will entice workers to regional areas. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk says the national campaign is designed to encourage people to regions which are suffering a worker shortage. We want people to come and work in our tourism industry. I've sat down with tourism leaders and they've said to me that there's a big chronic shortage of the moment of cleaners, people working in restaurants, in hospitality, working in the tourism experiences. So what we thought is we want to offer this incentive to people right across Australia. It starts on July the 1st and you'll be offered up to $1,500 to come and work in paradise. It sounds fantastic, it is fantastic, but, but really what we're seeing in Cairns, and I want to thank all of your viewers, people are flocking up here to the tropical far north, which is fantastic, but we are seeing some of our hotels that need more cleaners and of course in our restaurants and cafes, more staff, uh, more assistant cooks and chefs. So if you are thinking about moving, now's the time. Great lifestyle great place to live, great place to raise a family. I think we've actually done a really good job of really encouraging Australians to come to Queensland for their holidays. And the problem we have at the moment is because we don't have the large number of backpackers and international students, we do need people to work in the tourism sector. So look, we're, we're throwing everything at this. We want to give it a go and hopefully we will see some uh, people move up here. Already there's uh, reports of people who have done that previously, but now we're offering that added incentive to get them to come up. So it's anywhere from Mackay up to the tropical far north, but also to west of Toowoomba. I was out in the outback just the other, other week out at Longreach and Bar Calden. And, uh, you know, the cafes and restaurants were telling me they're the same thing. They're after cleaners, they're after uh, people to make coffees, uh, to help in the restaurants and the, and the cafes and the tourism, because people are flocking to Queensland for their holidays. Now let's head south to Melbourne, where there's debate over a proposed safe injecting room in the CBD, with the Lord Mayor Sally Cap calling for proper consultation. Reporter Zalika Ismail joins us now from Melbourne. Zalika, what did the Lord Mayor have to say? 
Good morning. Well, Melbourne's Lord Mayor Sally Cap has taken to social media overnight uh, to weigh in on these recent reports of a potential safe injecting room being opened at a site here in Flinders Street in Melbourne's CBD. Now, uh, she hasn't explicitly uh, discussed uh, any potential sites, whether she supports a site in Flinders Street or elsewhere. However, she did uh, give broad support to the idea of a safe injecting room here in Melbourne. She says these facilities save lives, that they take drug use off the streets. She references the existing uh, uh, site in North Richmond. She says it's shown itself to be critical in improving amenity in the area and uh, providing uh, helping in the safety of residents. Uh, but she has acknowledged uh, the concerns of, of traders, of residents and visitors as well about the impact of what a site might have on the local area. She says the state government must address those concerns, uh, including by introducing safety and cleanliness measures uh, wherever they end up choosing to open a site like this. She also says that consultation is really, really important, that the local community has a chance to uh, have their say and says a thorough consultation process is needed. And I think that no one's going to be arguing with that. We've seen already business groups on the weekend uh, uh, opposing the idea of the Flinders Street location, saying that the city is already struggling to get people back in uh, post-pandemic to get that revival back uh, happening. Uh, they've also even suggested a compensation scheme. So uh, definitely no easy answers here in a debate that uh, no, doubt, no doubt has some way to go still. And so, Zalika, you mentioned there that there is already one inject safe injecting room in Melbourne. That's in Richmond, just to the east of the CBD. What's been the experience with that safe injecting room in Richmond? Well, it's a mixed picture. It's been quite controversial since it was opened. You have some residents and parents of local uh, primary school children at the school, which really sits right next door to this facility. Uh, they say that the facility has exacerbated drug use in the area. Uh, parents say their children are being exposed to drug use uh, almost on a daily basis, uh, that it's acting essentially as a, as a honeypot, drawing in more drug users. But the state government and, and health experts have said uh, that the facts simply don't support that view. They say uh, that an independent review last year found uh, that the site is actually uh, reducing the amount of, of uh, antisocial behaviour, of drug paraphernalia in the streets. Uh, they also say that the facility has saved at least 21 lives and that it has made, uh, safely managed more than 3,000 overdoses. So uh, the state government is very adamant that it will open this a second site within the city. That was one recommendation of that independent review uh, last year, but of course it's still yet to be seen exactly where that is. They say that the city of Melbourne is uh, where this site should be opened. They cite statistics uh, which show uh, more than 50 people dying between 2015 and 2019 heroin related deaths so there's definitely a need here but yet to be seen where it will be opened. Okay Zalika Rizmal reporting there from Melbourne. Forensic analysis is expected to begin soon on the remains of the Somerton man whose body has been exhumed from Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery. Reporter Charles Bryce joins us now from Adelaide. Charles so explain why this case has baffled police for so long. Well, Joe, the Summerton man's body was found on an Adelaide beach in 1948 and uh, his identity has remained a mystery ever since. So for more than seven decades, police have been trying to work out exactly who this man is. Uh, there's been quite a few uh, clues linked to uh, this case over the years. Um, there was uh, a suitcase found sometime after his death with uh, items of clothing having all of their tags removed. Uh, there was uh, uh, incoherent writing, which people believe uh, was code. And uh, there was also a torn piece of paper with Persian, with a Persian phrase, uh, which translated to, it is finished. Uh, there's also been a number of theories around the man's death, including one that he was a Russian spy. The other one was uh, that he was killed by a jilted lover. So there's been many questions that have been unanswered for such a long time. So what happens next for the Somerton man? Well, his remains are now at the Forensic Science Centre uh, here behind me in Adelaide CBD. And police are going to be working with forensic scientists over the next couple of days to 
determine uh, how they proceed. Uh, his remains are actually in a pretty decent condition, so authorities are confident that they will be able to extract DNA uh, and they'll be using various methods on to, on to various techniques uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but forensic scientist uh, Dr Anne Coxon, uh, she said that uh, because the Somerton man's body had been embalmed for so long, that can cause uh, further complications because that uh, embalming fluid actually breaks down uh, DNA. Uh, but Joe, no timeline has been set on when the DNA will be extracted. It is expected to take some time and there will be uh, quite a team of people uh, working to extract that. There will be uh, anthropologists and a team of pathologists as well. And what do they think the chances are that the DNA will reveal his identity? Well, unfortunately, uh, they they can't exactly say, uh, you know, that it, it, there is a guarantee that it will reveal the identity. Um, they would have to, uh, you know, or even find out where the where the man came from. Uh, that would have to be matched up to uh, people on a certain database. Uh, so, unfortunately, there is no guarantee. Uh, but Joe, once the uh, initial process uh, with forensics is complete, it is the uh, intention of police to uh, return the Summerton ma the Summerton man uh, to the his initial uh, grave site. Okay, Charles Bryce reporting there from Adelaide. A split has emerged between Joe Biden and Israel's Prime Minister over military operations against Palestinian militants. The US President has hardened his language about the need for restraint, but Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to continue using firepower. Correspondent Greg Jennett joins us now from Washington. Greg, good day. So what's Joe Biden had to say to the Israeli Prime Minister? Morning, Joe. Yes, people who've been following this Middle Eastern crisis will be well aware by now that Joe Biden and his broader administration have been intent on practicing what they call intensive and quiet diplomacy. The key word being quiet. They haven't wanted to use the United Nations nor make explicit demands for a ceasefire on either party, not on its security partner in the government of Israel and not on Palestinian militant groups either. So it was that earlier today, Joe Biden had his fourth phone conversation with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and there was a bit of a shift in the language here. We'll bring that statement up now and run through it. This is the readout from the White House. The two leaders had a detailed discussion on the state of events in Gaza, Israel's progress in degrading the capabilities of Hamas and other terrorist elements and ongoing diplomatic efforts by regional governments in the United States. And here's the key part. The president conveyed to the Prime Minister that he expected a significant de-escalation today on the path to a ceasefire. So two things about that last sentence in particular. It puts a deadline down in effect. It says that there must be uh, some cessation, if not permanent, but just a lowering of hostilities by today within a 24-hour cycle and that that should be a down payment or stepping stone towards a ceasefire. Now, both of those elements in that final sentence do mark uh, a dialing up, really, of Joe Biden's public utterances on this matter. And that comes in the context of some pressure happening domestically here in the United States that he find a more assertive voice in this crisis, Joe. And is there any indication that Benjamin Netanyahu is abiding by that? Well, there's not. In fact, it didn't take long to get that very indication because the Prime Minister went out to military headquarters in Israel and did a tour of inspection there. He then did some media commitments broadcasting throughout Israel and offering certain assurances to the people of Israel that this military operation needs to continue and that it has an objective at the end of the day, and that is peace and security. Why don't we hear directly in his own words what Benjamin Netanyahu had to say on that, and then we'll try and un unpick what that means from here. You can either conquer them 
and that's always an open uh, possibility, or you can deter them. Uh, and we are engaged right now in forceful deterrence, but I have to say we don't rule out anything. We hope we can restore quiet. We hope we can restore it quickly. Yes, so he also went on to say, the Israeli Prime Minister, I am determined to continue this operation until the objective is achieved, he says, to restore quiet and security to you, the citizens of Israel. So that was a show of defiance up against what he surely would have known was a to-be-released readout of the conversation from the White House. Uh, for its part, here in the United States, the Biden administration has let it be known that it's not departing from its own strategy, and that is to continue this uh, quiet, uh, intensive diplomacy. It's involved more than 60 representations to all sides and other governments as well, Joe. But a little bit of a split, a bit of a hair's breadth difference at this point between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. OK, Greg Janet there in Washington. And tonight on the News Channel, we'll have a special program on the Middle East conflict hosted by Stan Grant. So as calls grow for a ceasefire, we examine the reasons behind the cycle of violence in Gaza and southern Israel. So that's 8pm tonight, Australian Eastern Standard Time on the ABC News Channel and anytime on iview. Now let's head to Cairns in far north Queensland where the Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk is taking some questions. Well, what we've seen is, look, I can remember when we were going through the pandemic, no one was coming to Cairns because no one was travelling. And that really had a big impact on workers. Um, but now we're seeing um, people have more confidence in travelling. And I really want to thank Australians because Australians are supporting the tropical far north. They, we put out the call for people to come. We had our Good To Go campaign where Queenslanders were supporting Queenslanders. And then we expanded that campaign into the southern states. And July, of course, is um, going to be, that winter is going to be a strong period, a strong season for up here. And we want to make sure that we start getting that workforce uh, in place. So please log on, look at the uh, array of jobs that are there, find something for you and uh, pack your bags and come north. Uh, Premier, the Queensland's North West Hospital and Health Service Board has been issued a show cause notice. Hang on, sorry. Sorry. The Queensland's North Hospital and Health Service Board has been issued a show cause notice amid concerns about its uh, financial management yes. government governance. Robbie Catter says it's not the board, it's the state government's issues, as with the opposition health minister. What's your response to that? Um, look, as the show cause notice has been issued, we have to allow those processes to take place, so I can't really comment on that. It's now for our members of that board to provide their response to the health minister. Yes. What about the other? Was there a reason why the region south of Mackay, like why they there? Not part of it. Part of it. Yeah. Well, well, they're they're going okay at the moment, and they're sort of within that drive market that people can, you know, hop in their cars where the large populations are in the southeast and, and drive. Look, we'll look at that over time as well if if there's an added need. But at the moment, we do know by speaking with all of our, um, our tourism bodies across the state that these areas are the highest need of demand at the moment. Yeah, well, look, I absolutely support airlines putting on more staff. That's exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to ensure that competition was kept. Uh, and we know how important Virgin is for regional Queensland. So adding extra staff is fantastic news. Mr. Chris has come out this morning um, and said that the state believes that the government was going to approach airlines about the World Camp idea, but they claimed that he didn't block it, saying there was no point until there was a commitment to build the facility first. Is this true? Uh, look, I've gone through this at length. I think Australians want to be kept safe. Queenslanders want to be kept safe and Australians want to be kept safe. And we know that uh, quarantine is a federal government responsibility. You know what, and the state signed up because we thought this was going to be for about a two or three month period. We are now well into a year of COVID and I think everything needs to be explored to keep Australians safe. So I believe all options should be on the table and the Prime Minister should be getting thorough briefings from his department and working respectfully with each and every leader about these crucial issues that will keep Australians safe. Last one.
OK, we'll leave that there for the moment. That's the Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk speaking there in Cairns in far north Queensland, announcing an initiative today to encourage people to get working in industries like tourism in Queensland where they're badly needed. Now, the annual Sculpture by the Sea exhibition in Sydney has brought art to the masses at Bondi and Tamarama beaches since 1997 and expanded to Perth 15 years ago. The event is currently on a high COVID hiatus, but organisers have put together a smaller exhibition of Japanese sculptures around Sydney Harbour. Reporter Ruby Cornish joins us now from Sydney. Ruby, good day. So tell us all about this new exhibition. G'day Joe. Well, yeah, our viewers will be familiar with Sculpture by the Sea, that iconic exhibition that happens down at Bondi every year along the cliffs and overlooking the ocean. But in the lead up to that this year, we have the inaugural Sculpture Rocks exhibition. It's down here at the Rocks in Sydney, right near Circular Quay. Uh, and for this year, it is featuring exclusively Japanese artists. So we have 13 artists and 17 artworks. Uh, there are a beautiful array of different kinds of works here and I wanted to show you a couple so this one right next to me is uh, by Koichi Ishino it's called Form of Scenery and I wanted to read you the art artist statement Joe because it really struck me uh, there is no point on the grid where one can make certain their existence so a bit of existentialism for you on your Thursday morning uh, in the background as well that red artwork is by Takeshi Tanabe it's called Locus of Time it's about the different shapes and forms that time takes uh, earlier this morning I I spoke to another artist who is exhibiting in this exhibition. She has two artworks in it. Uh, her name is Ayaka, Ayako Saito. Uh, here's a snippet of our conversation from earlier. My being part of um, Sculpture by the Sea gives us a chance to see our sculpture more objective way rather than be in a small studio. The site is very beautiful and very iconic Australian place, I think. So it's really um, privileged for us to be yeah, able to exhibit work. Ayako Saito there, an artist exhibiting at the Sculpture Rocks exhibition. Lots of these artworks are made of stone uh, or, you know, heavy materials like that based on Japanese rock garden traditions. Uh, and that makes them really suitable for this area because these artworks can't actually be anchored into the ground at this location. So they're all held together. They're all staying here under the weight of their own materials. Obviously, COVID has been a really difficult time for the arts industry in Australia. So little exhibitions like this help organisations like Sculpture by the Sea stay afloat and also let us um, observers come and enjoy art in a COVID safe way. Uh, this exhibition opens today and it will be going until the 3rd of June. So if you are in the area, get down here and check it out. There are some beautiful things to see. And Ruby, it enables us to witness you getting all cultural and existential on us on, on the ABC News Channel, so we're loving that. OK, we'll leave it there, Ruby Cornish there on beautiful Sydney Harbour. Time now for a check of the weather. It's a very good morning to Nate Byrne. Nate, pretty dry at the moment. Yeah, for most of the country and also chilly, it, even on the harbour there, Joe. We've had a bit of fog around this morning. There's exact same things causing that as what's causing all of the dry weather. We've got a broad ridge right across the south of the country, so high pressures ridge. Uh, there is a bit of cloud you can see here, all high level stuff, no wet weather out of that at all. Though in the southeast, a little bit of a different story. We've got a cold front that's coming through. It's bringing some pretty windy conditions, a little bit of wet weather too. But this broad ridge, you can see that's what's been keeping things really settled across most of the country. Although it has been pushing some winds into the east coast, that's causing a couple of showers for parts of the Queensland coastline, but mostly in the tropics. Now, this high has really been the dominant feature this week. It's what's been bringing us all of these frosty starts and now foggy mornings too. Uh, and it looks like it's going to last for a little while longer. And so when's the next front due? Uh, this weekend, actually, and it's looking like it's going to be a pretty decent one. Uh, kind of having a couple of bites at the cherry when it comes uh, to delivering wet weather. We're looking at probably Saturday, this frontal system starting to push into the west. And look at the extent of this wet weather potential, at least for, from this model, Joe, right up through WA, getting up into the northwest of the state potentially as well, and then drawing some of those falls across central Australia and then into the southeast, probably for mid next week. Now, this is only one of the models, but this front should be able to break down that 
Ridge quite a ways and be able to actually bring some of that wet weather to the middle. But unfortunately, it's whipping through, so not much. Uh, some of the outlooks I've seen, Joha, put some falls through this dry section here and then a little bit further uh, east as well, uh, but only at the sort of one to two millimetre sort of range. So really not a ton of rain expected, but for some parts, some good news, especially through the southwest of WA and for the southeast, where you know we could still do with a bit of a drink. This uh, final descent into winter means that these cold fronts are going to become a little bit more regular and we'll start to see some more falls. OK, so around the states and territories today. All right, let's get into Queensland where we do have some wet weather along the east coast, most of that for the tropics today, but any of the exposed areas, so any of those shores that are facing the wind could see some falls, otherwise it's going to be fine. Certainly in Brisbane it's getting to 23 degrees there today. In New South Wales, much the same story, clear skies after a bit of fog lifts for the east. There is a chance we'll see a couple of drops of rain just around the north coast though. For Sydney it's staying fine, it's getting to 22 and Canberra, foggy start but fine in 16 to come. It's pretty windy across the Victoria, we've got northerlies ahead of the front, whipping around to southwesterlies behind it. It's bringing wet weather as well, but most of the rain will be in the west and central parts, and it's clearing out through parts uh, through this morning and by early afternoon, it really will have eased. Completely dry by this evening, and that wind will back off then too. For Melbourne, it's just a couple of showers around 17 is the top. We've got some wet weather right across Tassie this morning. Now that's also backing off after lunch, just sticking around for the west and the far south later. Hobart, just a wet morning, 16 for you. Over in South Australia, a couple of falls for southern coasts and mostly in the south east. Otherwise, it's a dry day. Certainly for Adelaide, 21 will be the top there. While over in the west, you're sitting underneath that ridge, so completely clear skies, sunny and 24 for Perth. Up north, we've also got a bit of humidity creeping up for western parts of the top end, despite it being the dry and the odd shower for the Tiwis, also for the northeast Arnhem district but blue skies everywhere else Joe and Darwin it's a touch sticky but staying sunny getting to 33. Cheers Nate. You can keep up to date online at news.abc.net.au and on iview here are the day's top stories. The federal government is being urged to bolster its advertising campaign to ensure more people get the COVID-19 vaccine. More than 3 million doses have been administered across the country so far. However, doctors say many older Australians are putting off getting immunised and a better education campaign is needed. The Queensland government has launched a national campaign offering incentive payments to travel and travel subsidies to fill tourism jobs in regional parts of the state. The $7.5 million program includes a payment of up to $1,500 per worker and a $250 travel bonus to relocate. There's mounting pressure on Israel and Palestinian militants to halt 10 days of cross-border attacks. In his latest telephone conversation with the Israeli Prime Minister, US President Joe Biden has asked Benjamin Netanyahu for a significant de-escalation. Mr Netanyahu says he's determined to continue the military operation. And Sydney FC has moved into second place on the A-League ladder after continuing a recent domination of Melbourne victory with a 2-0 win. The Sky Blues registered their eighth consecutive win against their fierce Victorian rivals with a goal in each half at Cogger Oval.